the end of the world. <laughs> It's a pleasure to, uh, to have uh, Ron talk through the technique and tell us about multi collision resistance to flying. Thank you, Yuval. Uh, now I'm forced to think of some black holes uh, somewhere in the presentation. We'll see if it comes up or not. Um, Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, great to be here and thank you to the organizers for organizing this wonderful event and, uh, and inviting me. So uh, this title is about this, uh, sorry, this uh, work, it's a joint work with Prashant. Prashant is maybe somewhere around here hiding. What's hiding? Okay, uh, anyway, so joint work with Prashant. And it's about collision resistance. So uh, Moni yesterday talked about collision resistance. Also, uh, no, I don't think he talked about distribution of collision resistance, not about a multi-collision resistance. But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll reintroduce these uh, notions and show you uh, what I think is a surprising connection between these uh, two notions. Okay, so let's start with the basics. So uh, I assume that all of you are familiar with collision resistant hashing. It's one of the most basic uh, primitives um, in cryptography. So these are basically hash functions that are shrinking. So, you know, by, being, by virtue of being shrinking, there are a lot of uh, collisions, but nevertheless, it's computationally hard to find these collisions. And these are extremely uh, central throughout both practice and theory of cryptography. So this is a quote from the SHA-3 standard. So really when people think of a cryptographic hash function, this is one of the most basic uh, features that they're looking for, right? And you know, in, in theory, we have a lot of application for, uh, for such uh, collision resistant hashing. In particular, you know, one of my favorites is the succinct arguments constant around statistically hiding commitments, um, you know, Barak's result, non-black box, uh, zero knowledge, and so on. Okay, so let's formalize things a little bit. So, in, you know, throughout theoretical computer science, when talking about collision resistant hashing, we typically think of a hash function family, right? So let's think for simplicity, and we'll talk about it in a bit, uh, about hash functions mapping n bits to n minus one bits. So as promised, they are shrinking. We want them to be efficiently computable. Right, so like denoting the family by a capital H and each uh, function inside the family by a little h, you want, you know, given little h and then input x, you want to be able to compute h of x uh, efficiently, but it should be uh, hard for a uh, computationally bounded adversary to find collisions. So far, okay? Okay. So, you know, following the theme of this workshop, you're looking for minimal assumptions in cryptography. And the question, you know, can you make do with a weaker notion than collision resistance? Suppose you, you have a situation in which you have this sort of shrinking hash function, in which sadly enough, you know, there's a way to find pairwise collisions, but you know, it's hard to find three-way collisions. Okay. So this is called an object called multi-collision resistant uh, hash functions. And uh, you know, the definition here is similar. We're gonna talk about it a little bit. Where did the definition title go? But these are basically, you know, as before we have a family of hash functions, efficiently computable, but now oops, it should be hard for an adversary given the description of a, the hash function to find you know, this uh, set X, capital X of, of size T. These are T distinct elements that all hash to the same value. Hard to find a T-way collision. Okay, so natural generalization. Notice for this notion to be you know, non-trivial, non I need the shrinking to be at least a log T factor. Otherwise such big collisions may not exist. Yes. Can you explain the most about that? There are extensions of this uh, form. You know, you have to uh, compute it exactly, but yes. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about this factor of like how much you shrink by. So typically when talking about regular collision resistant hash functions, basically we don't care. Once you have a shrinkage of uh, sort of one bit, then, you know, you can get whatever you want. The morally true but imprecise proof is, you know, do this. Just compose a function with itself. Okay. Um, so basically, you know, as a notion, we can think of one bit of shrinkage, you can get whatever you want. Um, what about MCRH? Well, I don't know. It's worked once, why not try it again? So the problem is when you do this, you know, even if you have just like it's possible to find pairwise collisions, as you keep doing this, the number of collisions you can find grows exponentially. So it's much more complicated. Turns out you can do something uh, so, so, somewhat better. So uh, near and Omer and Yael showed a method for doing this better, but still it grows quite dramatically. Number of collisions. So here we really, so my, my point is that, oh, and this all has to do with the, you know, the wonderful fact that one to the K is equal to one, but two to the K is not equal to one. Um, is that equal to two? 
Yeah, that's what you want. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on K. <laughs> um, okay. So basically, when, when talking about this notion, I like to keep track of also the shrinkage by how much is my hash function shrinking. So we're going to be talking about a T L M C R H, meaning that it's hard to find collisions of size T and you're losing at least L bits. Okay. Good. Okay. And sanity check, you know, if you plug in T equals uh, two and L equals one, we got the standard definition. Okay. So a couple of words about prior works on this notion. So the first work that I'm aware of that studied this notion is a work of uh, Zhu. It was kind of a more practice-oriented talk. You're looking, uh, looking at specific hash function uh, constructions, iterated hash functions, and studied multi-collisions uh, there. The first theory work uh, that I know of that studied multi-collisions is by, yeah. Why would studying in a practical setting could he find that's normal? No, so he, he, was, he wanted to show that basically multi-collision implies collision resistance for these functions. Or, from his perspective, if you can find some collisions, you can find a lot of collisions. <laughs> so uh, this work of uh, Moni, Elon, and Elan showed it was sort of focused on studying a computational ranty problem, but introduced a connection to this notion of MCRH. And then, you know, uh, somewhat ironically, we had the three-way collision of papers studying uh, <laughs> collision resistant, uh, three-way collision resistant hash function. So work uh, <laughs> with Prashant, uh, Akshay, and Itai, and work, uh, this work that I mentioned before of Yael Omer and Nir, and another work of Ilan, uh, Moni, and Elon, all gave sort of a more systematic study of MCRH. I'll mention some of the results. And we collided at MIT when yes, we, 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 I came to, to talk about it with you, and suddenly yeah. we hear the same stuff. So Moni and I realized we have a collision, we started talking about it, and then we see on the side Yael Omer and Nir talking <laughs> exactly about the same thing. Um, well, it was literally also a physical collision. Um, <laughs> so who won? Okay, and the, the last paper that I want to mention, which is really the inspiration for this work, is another work by uh, Ilan and Ilan, which showed that if you have an MCRH, then you can construct a distribution of CRH. So a hash function in which it's hard to find random pairwise collisions, but nevertheless, it still, may still be possible to find worst case collisions. Okay. Okay, so you know this, uh, as the title sort of uh, was meant to indicate, this paper was about studying the relation between CRH and MCRH, and a priori it's not clear what we should think. So, you know, having st started work with this notion, it really has a feeling that MCRH are qualitatively a different beast than CRH, and I think this domain extension thing with the, with a with the shrinkage really sort of hints to that. So that's sort of my first, uh, not just first reaction to this notion of MCRH. On the other hand, if you look at things that you can actually construct from MCRH, well, you know, it requires, you know, writing paper, which is a good thing, but you can do most of the things, right? So in particular, constant around statistically hiding commitments, you can do still from MCRH, uh, succinct arguments, uh, beautiful works that showed how to do succinct arguments, you know, in the flavor of Killian's work. Uh, so you can do these things, and though this begs the question, are <laughs> standard collision resistant hash functions actually stronger than MCRH? So our main results are that in some settings, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll explain the results, but in, in, in some sense, the answer is no, um, but in a very particular sense. So I'll show you what the main results are. So the first main result is, is that if you give me an MCRH in which it's hard to find three-way collisions, it could be possible to find pairwise collisions, but hard to find three-way collisions, and it needs to be shrinking by a factor of half, a bit more than half. So not, not, not too bad, kind of standard. If that's true, then I can construct for you a collision-resistant hash function. You can go from three-way MCRH to two standard CRH. There's a star that I, I will explain a little bit later. Okay, so not exact, but morally, I feel it's true. Good, but this is only for three. So what about four? Uh, so you can do it also for four. So if you give me uh, MCRH in which it's hard to find four, collisions of size four, uh, we still know how to do it. We need better shrinkage. It needs to shrink to a factor of like one over six. You can still do it. Okay, you know, you only have like bounded space in the slide. Um, so what about five? Well, that's open. If you give me a five MCRH, which shrinks to anything, log squared, I don't know how to do anything with it. Well, actually I do know something. I know how to build a four-way MCRH out of it. See, it looks silly because I have a theorem, but the shrinkage is not good enough. So I can't apply it. Okay, so these transformations come at a cost. 
even no matter what anything that I provide, even log get to the one plus lambda one, I can do it. Okay. What I can do in general is you, if you give any T L M C R H, it can reduce T to some for some values of T prime, but the shrinkage, there's a the cost of the shrinkage. Okay, and it's a terrible formula. I won't show it to you what it is, but just to give the flavor, if you give me, you know, an MCRH of like hard to find the size 100 collisions, which shrinks uh, to like one over 10, then I can bid from it one, which is hard to find collisions of size 50, which has, uh, you know, shrinks to uh, 40%. Questions? Yeah, so you're saying that you're going to what you have like uh, 50 it's also 51 52 sure yeah. but, okay, 45 so and um, it depends it's a terrible formula and uh, I need to plug it in and see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unconditional, right? Yes. And anything. I mean, they're conditional in run sense. Uh, and yeah. so, <laughs> all of course, anything there's unconditional in run sense. Uh, anything sub CRH, which can help us? I don't even have a, like a, a, we have a candidate idea. I'm not sure. This one? Yeah, no, I don't know. This is really about studying, you know, MCRH versus CRH. What you mean. Um, you were saying something to him about the formula is complicated, but in general, it works for any T and T prime. Yes. You go from no. 100 to... No, no, no. For example, like, I don't have to go from 5 to uh, 4. Yeah, or you can, but the I shrinkage can, but the is bad. So, like, the formula yeah. applies for every T and L, but maybe yeah, at no, some point it becomes true. No, if, if you go from, from 5 to 2, then it just won't be shrinking. Yeah, got it. So it works for anything, but at some point it doesn't shrink. And my other question for 5, do you have any, like... Intuition or barrier. Yeah, or so we have a barrier. So our, our our proof technique, and even on generalization of it, will not work. Okay, um, it, it is, but it is pretty specific to our proof technique. Yeah, so there's no barrier like black box barrier that you can go from here. Like, no, no, but that is open. <laughs> so, but you should be 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 aware, be aware of black box barriers. We'll see in a second. Well, it doesn't show you just in the sense that the output is is not short. I mean, is it does it still have collisions, or do you just get a function? I, 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 I get something that is not shrinking. We didn't check uh, how the collisions behave. It's interesting. I try to try to then uh, hash or something. Uh, I would assume that you know there are collisions. I don't know. Good question. Is the barrier to getting to two stretches the same or different than the barrier that you get to the place to 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 a place where you can start the extending the domain or whatever extending the street? No, for like even the, extending the domain even for three is really hard. You lo you lose a lot. But you can go to two and then you can extend there. Yes, right? but that that I can do. Uh, but, but that that sort of I, I can only do the domain extension really at two. I can see. do something. But so like, the question is, the, yeah. the barrier for domain extension is get to two. Uh, basically get nothing to two. more better than. So that. what you could uh, hope to do. So this sort of transformation is something that reduces T, but increases L. You might want to try to alternate. Right. Uh, we tried and we did not succeed. I see. So uh, do we have a guess to us like a pressure? Like, do you the answer is like yes or no? I think the answer is, inter is interesting. <laughs> 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 um, Believe that both exist, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, but uh, yeah. Did you try uh, to What's the star? The star, ah, I'm a second. Yeah. I, will, I will say. Okay, the other question is, uh, what if she doesn't need CRH? No, for, for, at least for the killer apps of CRH, MCRH suffice. So like, for example, Killian's protocol, there is you know, a much more complicated analog that works with MCRH. So is there any app that you don't know? Um, you know, the concrete apps, you know, file storage, you, you post your file on the cloud, you want to make sure you download, you get the same thing. You're, you know, if it's a CRH, then you're very happy. You're going to get the same thing. It's an MCRH, um, but you know, they can probably solve that with more tricks, but. Um, okay, so I want to show you the, the bird's eye view of the result, and that will also explain the start of how we do it. Okay. So actually, let's talk about what we don't do. What we don't do is not use a standard cryptographic reduction. So what is a standard cryptographic reduction? How does usually cryptography work? Well, if we're trying to build the primitive B from primitive A, in our case, a CRH from MCRH, what do you do? Well, 
you take your primitive uh, A, you use it, you throw in some algebra or combinatorics or some clever tricks. Typically, the way that uh, your construction of B uses A is as a black box, right? Just query. And then, okay, you're happy you have the construction, but you also want a security proof. The way that that works is that you take, you consider some adversary for, your, for this construction, and you show that you can use such an adversary to get sort of this green adversary for the original construction A. And typically also the, the way that the green monster uses the red devil is as a black box. And they also use the original primitive A as a black box. And this, you know, most construction and cryptography follow this route. It's called the fully black box reduction. So our construction is not going to be of this flavor. So at the high level, and this is really following Elon and Elon's paper, here's our approach. So we start off with an MCRH trying to eventually get a CRH. What we're going to do is to build a candidate CRH. It's a candidate. Uh, two options, either it's good or it's not good. Oh, and, and this candidate uses MCRH as a black box, regular. Either it's good or it's not good. If it's good, you know, I'd have to end the talk early. So let's assume that it's not good. Uh, but if it's good, then we're done. If it's not good, then there is an adversary, right? There's someone who breaks this candidate CRH. So what I'm going to do is to use this adversary in order to construct a different CRH. Okay, so given this adversary, I'll construct a different CRH. This CRH will use the adversary as a black box and the original MCRH. And the fact that it's an adversary for this candidate CRH will make the CRH secure. Yes. What, sorry? You, you want to prove this root to the 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 did you think about that? No, I did not. <laughs> um, okay, more questions? The adversary has to be uniform. Sorry? The adversary has to be uniform. No, so I'll talk about uniformity in a second. Okay. Uh, so, it's more really difficult to this. Okay, so if suppose you had something that was secure against the three collisions, you have a class one collision, I can't find two more collisions. I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I want to talk about uh, Luigi's point. So some repercussions of this proof technique. So it's nice, I think it's an interesting proof technique, but it has some, you know, uh, repercussions, but caveats, I think of it just as like more interesting stuff. Um, so first of all, you know, this is non-constructive. If you come along and give me, you know, your favorite best MCRH that you love, and you ask me, you know, Ron, you promised me a CRH. I know I can promise you that it exists. I cannot show it to you. Why? Because you know I have a candidate this year, right? I can show that one to you, but I don't know if it works or not. And if it doesn't, I need the adversary. I don't know what the adversary is going to do. Right. So I'll talk maybe about universal uh, thing, constructions in a second. Um, I'll talk at the, at the end of the talk about universal constructions. Same thing like with this proof. It's a proof by it's an existential proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is an also an existential proof. The second thing has to do with Luigi's question. So usually in crypto, we model adversaries as non-uniform adversaries. If we do this, then you know we inherit the non-uniformity in our construction. So evaluating the CRH will be done by a non-uniform algorithm. If we think of the adversary as uniform, then the construction will be uniform. So what, it's just one shot, the, the thing? It's like either the first construction yes. is good or the second one is good? You yeah. don't need to like recurse and say, no. oh, this one is not good. Then well, that just needs the adversary and, and then. And that's a big family because the second one might uh, has a call to an adversary. Has a call to that adversary. If I wanted to enumerate, like here's all the list, one of them works. That's a big yeah, list. Yeah, I mean there could be different adversaries, and it's a, yeah. Yeah. there's no way priority is polynomial down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the last thing is, you know, if we're talking about standard cryptography, you know, um, we have we want big security everywhere, but that would mean that that the potential adversary only works infinitely often. But that means that our construction also only works infinitely often. But so well, when it doesn't, it's that uh, your original thing is good. So if you have a combiner between these two things, then. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, so, okay. Because for every input length you don't, it's like a, 
yeah, it's more complicated. Okay. Um, more questions? Okay. So, shuffling back to your uh, question, the star is about being infinitely often and then uniform and, you know, non constructive, but that's. Uh, Okay, so I want to show you, uh, you know, it was the bird's eye view. Let's see how it's done. Okay. Um, the next one is going to be an elephant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's focus on the basic theorem, how we go for, for starters, from a 3M CRH to a 2M CRH, regular CRH. So we'll start off with our, uh, you know, hash function family H. Let's assume that it's a 3M CRH with this uh, L bits of shrinkage that disappear. And just, uh, just to emphasize, I'm going to maybe, uh, if Steph was asking, H itself might be an awful, awful CRH, right? It could have collisions baked into it. it could even come equipped with a button that gives you random collisions. It could be terrible. You could try to do some sort of hashing uh, tricks that doesn't seem to work. Um, but we will try in a sense. So what we're going to do is introduce another uh, function family G. It's going to be non-cryptographic. We'll see later what properties we need. This is a, a mapping, again, the same n bits as H to m bits. And I'm simply going to do concatenation. So given this family G, which I have not specified yet, we'll see what it needs to do later. Now to hash an input X, I just put output H of X, but I append also G of X. And I think of both H and G as the key to this, fam this uh, function family F. So far so good? So this, 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 that does have the flavor of a standard construction with a pair of independent hash or something like that. Okay, so you know, the big question is, is this construction secure or not? Well, and it's small, right? Yes, and I want this to be shrinking. So we need to, we'll, we'll do that counting later on. This needs to be shrinking. But the question is, you know, is it a CRH? And I don't know, as before, if yes, we go home early. Uh, so let's assume it's not. Um, it means that there's an adversary. There's an adversary that breaks this candidate CRH. So what is this adversary doing? Right, it gets a description of a hash key, so H and G, and it finds two different inputs, X1 and X2, that form a collision both on H and on G given that, you know, that F computes both of them. Okay, nice. And, you know, let's assume for starters that A is perfect. It works on every input length with probability one. Okay, um, good. So I want to try to use A to find larger collisions of H and then to violate its multi-collision resistance. So let's see, let's suppose that I run, so I'm, I'm trying to now violate the collision resistance of H. So let's suppose that I uh, run A on input H and some G, that I come up, come up with, then, you know, <coughs> I get a collision. Then I run A again with the same H and some different G, some G prime, and I'll get some other collision. And I want to ask myself, can we find a G and G prime so that these values collide? If so, I'm very, very happy because I, I, you know, apparently I have like a four-way collision, something like that. So what is G? If not, that, so it means like if I can, it means that I broke H, which is a contradiction, which seems to indicate that they should be hard to find G and G prime that collide, right? So a collision in the adversary in some sense. So I'm going to use A, show that A is collision resistant. It's hard to find collisions for this adversary in this sense. We'll, we'll be specific more, more, much more. Confused, why is it a four-way collision? Because the first pair under H, forget G, it's not the same as the second pair. Right, but so, so if, if I manage to find G and G prime so that these guys are the same. Oh, like, even under H. Yes, are the same under H. That's what I care about. When I say here collide, I mean that the H of X1 is equal to H of X1 prime. I see, I see. I see. If I manage to find Little G and G prime like that, good. then I'm very happy. <laughs> Maybe a subtlety to, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> Sorry. No, um, yes. Again, can you read what is the role of G here? What is G? So G is, you think of it as an additional uh, input that the adversary gets. Well, information or something. Some, some additional information about, uh, about um, X. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that, you know, you can find collisions here. Now I'm trying to run it um, different with, different, with different Gs. I get different, you know, I should get different collisions. If I get the same one, then I'm very happy, but it should, which means that it should be difficult to find it. So A guys, the mutated or randomized. Sorry? Yeah, the, the average age, do I assume it to be deterministic? Let's think of it as deterministic for now. It's perfect for its property to one, so I just fix points to zero. Um, question? So can you repeat the signal of the G prime? Yeah, so let's see, let's see more precisely, okay? 
So I'm going to the, so given this given this intuition, I'm going to define a new hash function family, which is trying to form these collisions of G's. So the input, the domain for this hash function family is functions from G. And the output is like the output of the original H. And the way that this new uh, function family works is I'm given an input of a, a description of a family of a function G. You run your attack, your adversary, for the, our candidate CRH F, and you get this collision X1, X2, and you output H of X1, which is supposed to be the same as H of X2. Okay, and I want to prove that this guy is a CRH. Okay, so, so let, let's do this. So suppose that it is not. What does it mean? It means that you, know, you can attack this new hash function family. Its key is just H, right? So now it means that given H, you can find the collision for this previous hash function family. So you can find G, which is different from G prime, so that their evaluation is the same. Meaning that the H of X1 that you get here is the same as the H of X1 prime that you get here. So let's sort of uh, see what this, what this tells us. Well, when we run A on input G, we get X1 and X2. When we run A on G prime, we get X1 prime and X2 prime. And we know because A works that you know, X1 and X2 form a collision under both H and G. We know that X1 prime and X2 prime form a collision under both H and G. And we know because uh, of this, that H of X1 is equal to H of X1 prime. So putting this out together, you know, we have a four-way collision. We have H of X1 is equal to H of X2, equal to H of X1 prime, equal to H of X2 prime. And we didn't even to use any, need to use any property of G. None of them are, none of them are the same. Ah. So that's exactly the issue, right? So our concern is, you know, thus the justified concern is what if it's the same collision? So it's a, it's a multi-set of size four, but is it actually a set of size four? And I, so that, that's what's worrying me. And I want to ensure that it's not the case. And that's where I'm going to use properties of G. Okay, so what do we know so far? So we know that G is different from G prime, but we have the G of X1 is equal to G of X2 and G prime of X1 prime is equal to G prime of X of uh, X2 prime. Wouldn't it be great if we could guarantee that for any distinct pair X1 and X2, there's only one G on which they can collide. That's such a situation. Um, as above could not occur. There's only one such pair that can, can exist. So I want to set up G to have that property. Okay. We, so we understood this and this, you know, uh, rang the bell from a uh, elementary school or something. But, you know, if you look at two distinct pairs of lines, they can intersect on at most one point. Okay. So we would like to have a construction in which the X1s play the role of lines and G of X1 corresponds to the evaluation of the line at some point. And then two lines, X1 and X2, can intersect and at most one G. Okay, so more specifically, <coughs> what, do we, what do we do? But this would still be a three-way collision, yes. not a four. Yes, you can just guarantee that these two pairs are different, exactly. So we're going to fix a finite field of size two to the n over two. Each function uh, G is going to be specified by a field element, it's like where we look at on the line. And each point X we're going to interpret as a line. So you can think of it, you know, interpret it in your favorite way over this field as two field elements, say, by coefficients, right? And then, you know, fun fact, if you look at any two distinct x1 and x and x uh, prime, these are degree uh, one polynomials, they can be the same at most one point. They're different. They can be exist at most one g on which they agree. Question? Okay. So we have found, as Tal was saying, we found a uh, three-way collision. Why? What do we know? You know, no, just so this copied from the previous slide, all of this we know. But now I'm claiming that it cannot be the case, that like what Staff was concerned about, that these collisions are the same. Why? If they were the same, then, uh, you know, we have uh, both G and G prime, which, uh, you know, uh, these two lines intersect on uh, two points, both on G and G prime. Okay. So we found a three way collision for H. But H is a uh, you know three-way collision resistance, so we have a contradiction. Okay, questions? G, the output of G is very large. So, ah. to... so let's talk about this the shrinkage. Yes. I guess I'm probably going to talk about this. 
can you expand this trick to start with a higher and going to lower and then using like not a line parabola or degree? <coughs> yeah. okay. That's what I meant. But before that, that's uh, and the yes question how is the shrinkage? And we have two hash functions that we're worried about, right? We have the candidate one and this one. So, you know, G is mapping n bits to n over two bits, so it's a lot of bits. So if you look, if you think, if you recall the original, the candidate construction was like appending these n over two bits. So you output n minus L, which is the original thing, plus n over two. So it's still going to be shrinking as long as you're losing at least n over two. So that's okay. The second guy, its input was, you know, um, a description of a function of, from, a, uh, sorry, a description of, an L, of a function from G, which is specified by a field element. So there are two to the n over two such guys, meaning that the size of the input for this candidate thing was n over two. And it was still outputting the n minus L things of the original guy. So as long as L still, same uh, again, L still needs to be bigger than n over two, then you're still shrinking. Okay, so as long as the original thing was shrinking by more than n over two, we are happy. Yeah, okay. Okay, so question, uh, going to uh, third uh, question of, you know, can you do better? You know, we were very naive. We went to elementary school. Maybe if you go to high school, uh, you can do better by, by choosing G better. Yes. You asked if, if you can rule out uh, other, you know, approaches. I'm, re I'm uh, reinterpreting. Um, <laughs> so the answer uh, turns out to be no here. And um, you can show this by the singleton bound, they won't show it. Okay, so this is a choice of G is essentially optimal here. Okay, so if you follow this blueprint. Okay. Questions about uh, 3M CRX to CRX? Can you go basic back idea. to the construction? Yeah. Analysis or the no, the, uh, okay. so re really we're trying to form to find collisions in A. Hope you handle randomizing. Okay, so uh, first of all, if, if if we think of like non-uniform adversaries, I don't need to worry about it. Did we? Uh, did we? Uh, I mean, in the in that paper, we just uh, did the non-uniform. I randomized. I'm expect it should not be a big deal, but uh, I'm not sure. I think you will have this for me in the time collision and stuff. Um, Maybe just also output it, both input and output, that, that should be fine. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, how many reasons of time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's talk about how do we, how do, we do to go from four MCRH to CRH. So actually, I'll show you how to go from four MCRH to three MCRH, and then we can apply the previous thing. So as uh, Ilya predicted, same basic idea. We uh, try to build a collision finder now that finds distinct G, G prime, and G double prime. Uh, but instead of looking at it as a line, we look at the uh, degree two curve okay, uh, uh, as predicted. So actually, let me skip this and go directly to what I wanted to say about TLM CRH, whether it's a little bit more interesting. So from TLM and CRH, how do I improve the T factor? Uh, so here I'm going to choose a smaller finite, finite field by, by some parameter K so that I look at the input and I see K field elements instead of the line corresponding to two field elements. And I'm going to interpret them as a degree K minus one polynomial. And as before, I defined the function to be you know, h of x, my original mcrh, tl mcrh, and I output this value of, I'm thinking of x as, I'm interpreting x as a polynomial, a degree k polynomial, and evaluating it at the point g, okay, as before. So now I ask, as before, you know, uh, so let's say I'm trying to, to say that either the candidate construction here is a t1 mcrh, or an alternate one is a t2. MCRH and they can, can try to balance the parameters. So this guy's a good T1 MCRH, super happy. So the interesting case in which it's not, I can find here collisions, right? So given H and G, I can find T1 size collisions. So now I can uh, try to run, you know, I build again, exactly as before, this new MCRH, exactly as before, I run A, so I get input G, I run A, I get this T1 size collision and I output its value. And now, you know, if I suppose that this, this other construction is not a T2 MCRH, I can find T2 size collisions. 
So I can build up this big table, right? For each one of this T2 size collision, I have like, you know, G1 up to G T2. And for each one, I found a T1 size collision. So I have this big, nice table full of, uh, of X's. Now each X is a polynomial. So I have this uh, matrix T1 by T2, all full of polynomials. And the property that I know is that if you look at the i row, each row has a, uh, is exactly T1 distinct polynomials that all agree on the value GI for that row, right? So the table full of polynomials, really happy. And the combinatorial question that I want to ask myself for a debris question is what is the minimal number? So an adversary might try to you know, put in here the least amount of polynomials so that I don't find a big collision. So how many polynomials can I pack in here so that I still have this property? The question makes sense? Packing bound, you mean, right? Mm -hmm. It's some sort of packing bound that goes to something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. So we analyze this via read on this decoding. So the, the point is, you know, if you put it up this table and you look at them, you think of, you know, a function which gets all of these polynomials agree on G1 with some value. So think of a function that has this value here and this value here and so on. You get some description of a, of a, of a function. If, you know, the number of different polynomials here is very small, then overall, it means that there are a lot of polynomials that agree with this function. But this decoding tells us that this cannot be the case. Okay, so this is why you know we have some not so nice formula um, based basically on this idea. This read solving list decoding it's it's uh, related to your approach. If yes. there was a different approach using designs, for example, uh, I think that uh, I, okay. So first of all, you can replace. You can put any code that you want here, and we can use this list decoding to analyze this. Um, so you don't get much better than what we get from uh, Ritsa. Yeah, maybe it's saying that there is a combinatorial instruction for design, but maybe there are not this results there. Yeah, we, we start we start via the lens of designs, but uh, right. Um, um, what did I want to say? Uh, but oh, maybe just emphasize, all we care here is about combinatorial list decoding. We don't need efficient algorithms. Just about how many polynomials can you plug in here? It's the one of the adversary to find them. So I'm not going to say that. Right, questions? OK. So, so far, I was talking about you know, perfect adversaries. I want to say, uh, in the time that I have left, I want to talk about how we deal with you know, imperfect adversaries. And there are various ways in which the adversary may be imperfect. So problem number one is that the adversary an adversary potentially may only succeed on an infinite number of input lengths. So I, I already told you how I solved that. I basically assume it away. So our resulting CRH is only going to be infinitely often secure. Okay. If we get around that, it would be great. It would be done on half. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. More interesting, you know, the adversary that we assume for our candidate CRH, it gets an input H and G, and sometimes it works. It finds collisions. Sometimes it doesn't work. So let's first consider the case that it only works for a small fraction of the H's. So the way we handle this is by sort of in our construction of the, the other, the eventual FA CRH, we boost up these H's on which the adversary likes to succeed, right? So we, we sample an H, we check, does the adversary like to work on this H? If it does, great. If no, we do a sort of rejection sampling. The problem is that this sort of, uh, you know, what's the word? Um, sort of messing around with the probability space also messes uh, around with the success, the success probability of the end adversary that we have, like mapping the end adversary that we have for FA to an attack on the original H, but we bound this effect. So it's, a, it's a, an effect by a multiplicative factor which we can bound. Um, so that's that. The last thing is maybe the most uh, cute, so I'll show you. So suppose that this FA that we constructed, remember its input was a description of function G and we mapped, we uh, um, outputted this uh, collision. Suppose that it only works for a small fraction of the Gs. What will we get? That this FA, basically on the Gs for which the adversary doesn't work, we kind of get nothing. So let's say we output bottom. So this kind of gives rise to, the, to a notion of a partial domain CRH. Kind of think of now, if, uh, if I lost you, we can sort of come back. So the situation, think of a situation in which we have a hash function mapping n bits to say n minus uh, at least omega log n bits. And this hash function, is such that you know on some noticeable fraction of the domain, it doesn't output bottom. So for a large fraction of the domain, it may output bottom, but for a noticeable fraction, it does not. And I'm asking you 
Can you find the collision? Of course, not of bottom. And it's like noticeable error. So this is a, we call this a partial domain CRH. And what we show is that if you have a partial domain CRH, you can get a full-fledged CRH. You can, in general, amplify collision distance this way. Um, in what sense? That if you have a CRH which is only um, only collision resistant, it's very any small. But this is not the, this is not in the. If you're talking about the the range, I agree. But here it's the domain. You have you know the, the function is only defined on smart parts of the domain. And now I, I want to build something else that's defined in on zero once again. I see. In, in terms of the, the domain, yeah. Are you translating? Yes. And it's important that their shrinkage is super logarithmic. Uh, yeah, because otherwise you'd have like the trivial thing, okay. right? Yeah. Um, in which the collisions do not exist in this noticeable part. Okay. But this needs to be meaningful. Question? If you like tail end the, 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 the is it, you're asking how sharp it is, is it, is it yeah. exact? Uh, I'm not sure that up to a bit, I did not check. So I like this kind of question, but I didn't check it. Yes. And so before that, if your uh, construction is not uniform as it is, does it have to be infinitely often? Yes, because my, my adversary works infinitely often and on input lines, which it does not work, I don't know. What to do. No, but you can't take the construction. Oh, sorry, there's the a construction. construction. I don't know. Maybe there's some other adversary. It's, it's messy. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to do translations. I, I think this is what you meant. So this uh, technique fit, you know, um, but by, uh, I think the first invocation of Altman's proof that BPP is in the polynomial hierarchy, but it's been used in uh, many works in cryptography, uh, mostly by money. Uh, and by near, uh, then maybe that covers everything. Um, okay, so how do you go from partial domain CRH to full domain CRH? By the way, I think it's a, it's a if, when you see it for the first time, it's shocking. Um, then you get used to it and it's still shocking, but uh, you appreciate it. So here's the idea. So I take my partial domain uh, CRH, this is H, and I'm going to consider shifting the input space. Okay, so Z1 up to ZK are possible different shifts of the input space. And the way that I define my new hash function, h prime, is that I'm going to consider the first shift that falls in my area that does work. And I output the hash value of that point. So the entire family is like this. It's not yes, the, the hash key is described by the original hash key, as well as these shifts, z1 up to zk. But, 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 but the, the original zero yes. rate, which is only partial domain. Yes. yes. Is the, the, the partiality of the domain, does it change from hash function to function in the family or is it yes, fixed it the same family? No, it can. It can be all over the place. Like different, Actually, different. It's good for you, but all over the place it's good. And, and, and the bad bad cases where it's all the same. It can be arbitrary, so uh, it's not. I see. So it could be that all the functions in the family are, are on the, the same issue. place, which is uh, really nasty. I see. Okay. okay. That's, that's, that's why it's just a notification. Yes. Right. So as, as was pointed out, these shifts are random. And there are parts of the description of the hash. I see. So okay, so actually, turn it into something that you can. Yes. Translate. This is what you meant by translating. Yeah. So I, tra I translate it and I go to the first translation that you know, works. And I also output which one works. Here, here I'm losing log and this. Sure. Uh, goes to Marshall's question. And notice, so and I output the first one. So first, a claim, a claim that with high probability over disease. So for every, look at some particular x. Let's say that with very high probability over the z's, this, like, I would find an i for which this is defined. Why? Because, you know, you repeat enough times, it will work. If this is true for any individual x, now it's union bound, and would be true for all of the x's. Okay, so this is where the miracle happens. Um, so that, that's a proof of that. And notice that if you're able to find a collision for this hash function family, you can directly translate it into a collision for the original h by, you know, peeling away the, the shift. Questions? So uh, let me sort of end by pointing out some uh, open questions, including things that were raised here today. Uh, so one big thing, you know, get rid of all these annoying qualifiers. And in particular, one thing that would be very nice is to try to use a universal construction. I say, you know, two things that seem to me problematic with universal construction, but you can just like change, change the, the game. So first of all, I think for a universal construction, you want to think about uniform security because you want to do some sort of a, and kind of thing all over everything. So for non-uniform, I think I don't see how to do it. For uniform, there's you know, more potential. The other thing to me that seems important is don't think about you know, polynomial time adversaries, but think of like fixed time. So enter the log n time adversaries. And then potentially you can do something and 
not not entirely sure, but in that you know setting, there is potential to do to do something. Um, so that's that. The other thing I already pointed out for five MCRH, I don't know how to do anything. If one of you guys manages to do it, fantastic. Then I will ask about six and you know any other constant. Once you're done with that, we'll start going to super constant. <laughs> so there's plenty plenty of papers to write and uh, stuff to do here. Another question, you know, as uh, MCRH, you know, black box separated from uh, CRH. So um, you know, there, at some point there was a claim about this, but there was a bug, so currently it's open. So um, even, even separating three from two is, is open. Yes. Yeah. There was separation for a distribution. From what? From what to what? From multi collision resistance to distribution? Or even distribution just to collision resistance? Um, I don't think so. Near parking and I don't think so. Okay. I forgot what separation would be great. Um, last thing, I think it's you know it's somewhat weird to use the adversary constructively, but you know we got something out of it. Uh, hopefully, more can be gotten out of it. Particularly, there are, you know complexity people in the crowd. Maybe it's randomness. Maybe in other fields, it could be useful. Uh, already, we've seen. Uh, I've heard of the use of it in the context of uh, by uh, Abhishek is here somewhere uh, by Abhishek and William and others. Um, so we'll be talking about that. They, they use sort of a similar style of technique. Maybe this can be useful. Um, you know, the biggest question I think in this area is you know trying to build collision resistant hash functions from one-way functions or one-way permutations seems incredibly hard, right? We have Simon's result which shows that uh, uh, an orbital separation. But you know, our technique, maybe I didn't say this, our technique is not black box, yeah. right? Where you're using the adversary, the adversary does crazy things with the construction, it's not black box. Maybe you can use this style of idea to get, you know, get around Simon. So uh, it's Simon's. That's Simon's. <laughs> <laughs> so when not at Simon's, when at the big university, I was uh, I was proposing this, but then if I pointed out that while our technique is not black box, it does relativize. So it will not bypass Oracle separations. So for people doing black box separations, which are not Oracle separations, just be aware that sometimes uh, black box separations are not enough. Okay, so I think I've, I've ended. Why am I setting up the time? It comes up with <laughs> Even before it was invented. 